Hi, I'm Eric Topol, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm really delighted to have the chance to speak with Lucy Kalanithi, who is an internist on the clinical faculty at Stanford and uh, has co-authored a book, this book, which is a phenomenal book, When Breath Becomes Air. So we're going to be talking about Lucy's career, uh, the book that she, that, that Paul wrote, that she wrote the epilogue, and uh, what it means for as an inspiration for medicine, uh, for people facing cancer, terminal illness, and all sorts of things. So welcome, Lucy. Thank you. It's great to have you. I know that uh, you um, have had a, a busy time recently with the release of this book, and that uh, as a very young man, as your husband, Paul, who, who died uh, of lung cancer, um, and I would maybe just start off with, you, you all met at Yale Med School in the first year, what was it like? What was it that brought you two together? Um, that's right, we met in 2003 at Yale as first year students. Um, the, the literal thing that brought us together is that there's a hunger and homelessness fundraiser at Yale Med. Every year the students run it and I, my name was picked out of a raffle to go on a date with Paul. So. That happened, and then we were never apart after that. So, really? so <laughs> this was one of the love at first sight things, really. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Did you ever think that you'd wind up with a physician as a as a spouse? And was that you know, you know being a doctor yourself? Right. I never thought about it. You know, you you sort of make these decisions as you go through your life. And for me, I thought I was going to be an engineer or a math teacher, and then those sort of combined, right? The the personal and scientific um, to bring me into medicine. And then I was really drawn to Paul in medical school because he was also sort of a mix of um, uh, a really literary, philosophical guy who was coming into medicine for the really human, deep part of what it means to be in medicine. And that was why he was so appealing. Well, there's very different and complementary um, aspects of your personalities. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the book he, he alluded to a, a moment when you were reading uh, about a, a cardiogram, someone with ventricular fibrillation, yeah. and then you started crying because you realized that person had to have died from that. And it just kind of, in, in just a very brief um, description, it gave uh, a window to your uh, caring and emotional uh, self. And it just seemed like, whereas Paul is a kind of deep thinker with the background of having not only gone to um, Stanford but also with the extra masters in English there and then to uh, Cambridge with the philosophy and science all this extra stuff that he really was into this deep thinking stuff particularly I guess about the meaning of life is that did he, did he talk much about that or just thought about it yeah he was sort of talking and thinking about it all the time and not necessarily explicitly you know like quoting philosophers or talking about the books he loved, but just the way in which he was so engaged in life. You know, he was, somebody asked me, was he always really intense? You can tell in his writing that he's a real striver and very deeply thoughtful. And I said, yeah, he was always very intense, but it wasn't necessarily that he was always very serious. Um, he was just as likely to, you know, um, stay up all night drinking whiskey with an old friend and that's a form of intensity too yeah, right yeah, like sure. he was just really but really he, alive he could have a work hard play hard yeah, type of thing right. yeah no yeah. it's impressive yeah. but what i'm trying to get to understand mm -hmm. was that before he ever got to the point of being diagnosed with lung cancer it seemed like when he wrote the retrospective that he this was a, a thing the understanding not just the meaning of life but through death that is yes. Uh, what p perhaps what more of a challenge acid test to understand one's life than having mm -hmm. to face death so uh, whereas most people don't really think so much about this mm -hmm. this is something that he seemed to really cue into mm -hmm. long before he took ill that's right yeah it's um even as a young person he was very interested in literature and philosophy as a way to get at the question of what makes us human what does it mean to be human and then like you say thinking about death how do we make sense of our lives and build value despite the fact that we are mortal? And he surprised himself by entering medicine and ultimately it was because he wanted to be face to face with people making those really tough 
decisions and sort of um, approaching their mortality directly. And then when he himself was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer when he was 36 and a chief resident in neurosurgery um, at Stanford, those questions were no longer um, uh, theoretical. They were deeply emotional and existential for him. And it's funny because as he's writing the book, he's talking about these questions about dying, right? How do I spend my time? Um, but really, those are questions about living. You yes, know? Um, exactly. Yeah. No, it, it's just the theme of meaning for life uh, comes through, uh, mm -hmm. shines through in an extraordinary way. So he then, um, you both uh, finish at Yale, you uh, do different residencies, uh, you at UCSF and mm -hmm. he at Stanford, I guess. He goes on to be uh, if ultimately in neurosurgery, mm -hmm. but the first part of the book where he's recapping what this kind of led to, there's a lot of deaths in there. You right. know, he, he, he focuses, he gives the most elegant description of what it's like to deal with cadavers that I've ever read. No less, he talks about his first death that he mm -hmm. encountered as, a, as a, a, a trainee and preemies that died and other patients. He had a list of patients. I mean, he really goes through these, had such a big impact on him. So it was really fascinating, and even the loss of his uh, co-resident friend. Right, uh, I guess, Jeff, from suicide, Jeff, yeah, that's right. from suicide, incredible. So he took all these lessons from, it seemed like. So then, uh, now he's well into the neurosurgery residency. Um, he's, he's not well, but mm -hmm. you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what happens? Right, so for a period of about five months before his diagnosis, he'd been losing weight, and started to have very severe back pain. And it's funny because he'd just come off his research years. He re-entered uh, you know, the work of a chief resident. And so he's on his feet 14 hours a day and he's skipping lunch. And you know, as an intern, he had lost 15 pounds. And so this seemed like the same thing being repeated, right? Like, right. okay, your, your back aches because you're doing these you know, long spinal surgeries, et cetera. And um, then he started to have night sweats. Um, and he got some lab tests that were a little off, and he got a back x-ray that looked okay, but things were kind of continued to get worse and worse, and ultimately um, he had a chest x-ray, and it showed nodules throughout, um, throughout his chest and it, throughout his lungs, and um, it was clear to both of us in that moment what that likely was, and then it was confirmed on a CT that we looked at together. He pulled it up on the screen, and we sort of, there was no, um, it was a really unmediated way to receive that news, you know, to look at his scan um, with our own eyes, and that was the way in which we sort of received the metastatic cancer diagnosis. Yeah, I know, and here it is this pretty unique situation of such a young guy, um, a doctor who dealt with a lot of brain tumors in his neurosurgery world, you as a physician, um, and also I think uh, now the spouse, and having to deal with this immense issue. And fortunately, I guess, he tested positive for uh, EGFR mm -hmm. mutation and got at least initially a very nice response to treatment mm -hmm. for Tarsiva, is that right? That's right, yeah. He was on Erlotinib Tarsiva, and it really brought him back to life. It was actually quite amazing to see. I think both of us, when he was diagnosed, thought he might even die that year. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up living 22 months, which is, um, probably around the median survival for stage four cancer diagnosis. But um, that first year was such high quality time because the therapy had so few side effects. So he ultimately um, went back to work initially as a neurosurgeon, he really wanted to finish residency. And he was always sort of working toward the best case scenario. So, you know, he knew that on Erlotinib, maybe he would live a decade. And he said, you know, if I don't become a neurosurgeon, I'm gonna be really mad if I live 10 years. Um, so the best case scenario was that, and he set down the neurosurgical path again. And then when Erlotinib failed, the prognosis shrinks, the, the treatment becomes more debilitating. And that was when he started to really focus on writing as his top priority. And we were also having a baby at that time. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, what I was also struck by um, is that here he's doing his neurosurgery residency and it seemed like he had done it and that he still wanted to make sure that he fulfilled every last uh -huh. uh, requirement. Wouldn't they give him a pass? I mean, you know, he's been treated with lung cancer and went through all this stuff. Or, 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 did, he, or did he not even try to say, you know, didn't I do enough to get, you know, uh, to graduate? He didn't 
Uh, yeah, you're right. So he was basically, he basically had met the technical requirements yeah. to graduate, but there's this moment, and he describes it in the book, where um, he was sort of doing um, like shift work in a way. He would come in and he would take care of patients, but he wasn't rounding. He was just in the OR. And um, again, that was to sort of meet the technical bar. Um, but after all these years of doing right, everything, right. I mean, 36 hours in the operating room continuously right. and all this other stuff that right. he had done, right? Right. And he also started saying later and later because the thing that was the richest for him was to, um, you know, the people that he was taking care of, to be shepherding people through this difficult time um, and not just being technically excellent, but being connected to his patients. And so that was what brought him enough meaning that he could suffer through. I mean, he was in pain and he was nauseated and we did a lot of work with his medications to try to control his symptoms so that he could be focused on his patients and what he wanted to focus on. So when along the way did he say, I'm going to do a book, I'm going to write mm. a book? When, when did he have this epiphany? Um, so it, it was really, I can't believe it ended up working out because um, he's He'd always thought he'd be a writer. He's a really talented writer. And he, oh, yeah, he could put that mildly. And he, and he loved it. He loved writing. And so he wrote that essay in the New York Times, How Long Have I Got Left? And he wrote it on a plane flight. And he wanted a way to work through his, um, you know, the challenge of facing uncertainty. Even when you have a terminal illness, you're still also coping with uncertainty about when and what and um, how does the, what does the future hold? And so he wrote that essay. He sent it to two friends. The first friend wrote back and said, this essay isn't that great yet. It's, you know, you buried your lead and it's really? not very funny and you're kind of making three different points at once. And the other friend said, I forwarded this straight to the op-ed desk at the New York Times. <laughs> and they, thank goodness, and they ended up publishing it, you know, almost without any yeah, edits. Yeah. And then he was approached by agents and editors after that, which was literally so, a dream come true. So that's really, mm -hmm. the, the op-ed yes. led to this. He, yes. he wasn't thinking of a book at that time. No. But with him being so sick, it must have been really hard. And, you know, you get into some of the things you had to do to try to get him uh, supported to be able to right. write. He obviously right. had immense talent. Uh, and this book, as Abraham Verghese says in the uh, prologue, uh, he says, it took my breath away mm -hmm. to read this, mm -hmm. uh, which is true mm -hmm. actually anybody who reads this book in fact it's no surprise when I first read it that this would become the number one book nonfiction you know everywhere uh, it has had uh, perhaps more impact than a book than I can remember actually mm -hmm. so you then had to finish the book because mm -hmm. he was so sick that he could only get so far mm -hmm. he tried I guess mm -hmm. and now that wasn't your thing I guess to be a writer mm -hmm. particularly at this rare rarefied level right. so how, how did you right. how did you deal with that yeah um so he there was more he would have liked to write um but when he died the book was a manuscript on his computer it was like an open word document and i he died on a monday night around 9 p.m and then 12 hours later i was on the phone with his agent and editor saying how can we still make this happen? And he'd wanted it to happen. Um, he'd secured the book deal. He was totally thrilled. And then when he knew he was dying and he couldn't work on it anymore, he said, can you please try to publish this in some way? And we didn't even know if it would be a series of essay articles or could it still be a book? Um, so uh, it took a lot of work through the year of 2015 um, to put it all together. and. Um, you know, it was copy edited and we supplemented it with other writing that he had done. So interestingly, he, here's an example. He had written in brackets, insert anatomy lab essay. And that essay about the anatomy lab, he'd written as a medical student. Oh, so there okay. were other pieces of writing that made their way uh, in uh. Um, to, you know, make sure that it could be a book. It's all his writing. Um, and choosing the cover and um, like a lot of different decisions, I had to make those for him and then write the epilogue. He had come mm -hmm. up with the title? Yes. Yeah. Which is in a, the, the title just couldn't be more. It's perfect. beautiful, yeah. right? Yeah, it's really. from a little Elizabethan poem by Greville that starts out by saying, "You that seek what life is in death, now find it air that once was breath." Mm. Mm. Yeah, and he was reading. He had this little volume of poetry that he read when he was sick, and um, there were these amazing poems like um, "The Glories of Our Blood and State" by James Shirley is another example. And he was so he's reading a lot about mortality and death. And when he read that little poem, he said. 
I think I have the title for my book. And he has this little star next to that line. It's beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, so, uh, by the way, you touched on the fact that there was another side of him that not just a deep thinker, serious philosopher into the meaning of life, but also a jokester mm -hmm. and a person with a lot of humor. It struck me so much when he said after to the Emma, the, the oncologist, after the diagnosis, he says, can I start smoking yeah. now? Or when he said when you had your in vitro fertilization, you had the blastocyst, and he said um, the baby's got your cell membrane yeah. or something. I mean, you know, <laughs> stuff that, yeah, just amazing. So he um, then uh, is essentially, because of what you've done together, the book, and then you're capping it off with this amazing um, epilogue, have really immortalized his life. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems as though what has happened here is that so many people have read this and been inspired to be able to face death, mm -hmm. but also to have uh, make the most of one's life as possible to be you know, mm -hmm. brave and courageous. So wh where do you take this now? You, you've, this, is a, this is a unparalleled story in so many respects and you're young and you've got a medical career and how do you integrate what's happened here with with your arc in, in medicine? Um, yeah and integrate is a great word I think. Um, it's funny because I thought after Paul died you know I'll work really hard to make sure this book happens and then I'll go back to my job. <laughs> sure. And, um, I'm an internist and I was um, at this great research institute at Stanford that thinks about healthcare value and then uh, with the response to the book, I've um, I've been able to enter this national conversation about end of life care, which I think is so compelling and so amazing to me, and sort of it's a it's a uh, a way in which this experience stretches forward into the future for me to be thinking about this as a widow and a former caregiver and a doctor all put together. Um, and it's funny because I don't know where it's going to lead me, but I'm also much more comfortable tolerating uncertainty. You know, since everything that happened with Paul's illness, it's sort of like, I think in medicine you, you get on this path and you feel like you're going to be on this one path that you can see stretching out, or you think you need a credential for every single thing you say, you know, and instead speaking about this personal experience um, has taught me something else about expertise and authenticity and making a difference, you know, so well, it's yeah, just there, been amazing there, for there me. There is some stuff beyond evidence-based medicine, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and what you're getting at here, which is something that particularly in our society has had such a difficult time groping right. with, and um, you've got some invaluable lessons and experience here to, to get out. So um, this has been, um, I think for me, uh, a great opportunity to really get in your head as to what all happened during a yeah. really horrific experience yeah. that has been turned into something that uh, is not just instructive, but as I mentioned, highly inspirational. And I really, you know, just give so much credit to you for many people who read the book come up, come out and say, well, what a courageous man and what a brave person mm -hmm. to look death in the eye mm -hmm. as, he, as he articulates. But equally so is what you've done and continue to do to take this mission mm -hmm. forward that um, all that you learned to help impart to others. So thank you for what you've done. Uh, we're you. very fortunate to have uh, a physician in our midst who can help take this forward. And uh, this, this book is, is one I think every medical student will have to read as part of the curriculum, but it's much bigger than that. It's not just about doctors learning about the care of, uh, of their patients, but you know, all people could benefit. So. That means you need about 7 billion books uh, translated into a lot of different <laughs> languages, so maybe that'll happen. So thanks, uh, Lucy, for joining us uh, on Medscape One-on-One. Uh, -on -one. And thanks to all of you for uh, um, your attention to a really interesting conversation uh, with really a remarkable uh, person and couple. And if you haven't read this book, you ought to, because if you haven't, you need to be inspired. Thanks very much.